This is the Monday, January 15, 2018 episode of the History Author Show. Visit our iHeartRadio channel or subscribe on iTunes for a brand new episode every other Monday morning. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old towns of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor. Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline, on the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys, oh, New York ain't New York anymore. Hello, history lovers, and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. This week, our time machine hops on I-95 and heads down to the Washington Beltway, through our nation's capital, and back in time to the Union-occupied city of Alexandria, Virginia. Once there, we'll meet an abolitionist woman and get her perspective during and in the years immediately following America's Civil War. Our guide on this journey is Paula Tarnapol Whitaker, author of A Civil Life in an Uncivil Time, Julia Wilbur's Struggle for Purpose. In the fall of 1862, with the Civil War raging, 47-year-old Julia said goodbye to the family farm near Rochester in upstate New York, and boarded a train to the capital of a divided nation. There was no I-95 in those days, no Acela, so this took a lot of guts for her to do. But Julia Wilbur had the courage of her convictions. An ardent abolitionist, Julia would spend most of the next several years in Alexandria helping recently freed slaves. Refusing to stop in the face of limitations placed on women at the time, Julia Wilbur aided those escaped slaves and hospitalized Union soldiers, and she later served in the Freedmen's Bureau as African Americans made their first steps to full citizenship. Based on Julia's diaries, letters, and other primary sources, A Civil Life in an Uncivil Time introduces us to a woman who threw herself into a changing society and helped bend it in the direction of liberty. You can find our guest online at paulawhitaker.com, at ptwhitaker on Twitter, or toss her a like at facebook.com slash ptwhitaker. As a special treat, we'll be bringing you this week's interview live from an historic building, the Lyceum, Alexandria's Historic Museum, built in 1839. Okay. Now that we've arrived on the southern shore of the Potomac, as the United States tear themselves apart, let's join Paula Whitaker and experience a civil life in an uncivil time. I'm joined by Paula Tarnapol Whitaker at the Lyceum, Alexandria, Virginia's historic museum. She's here to chat with us about a woman from the Civil War who is in this very building, among many others, doing her life's work. Her book is titled, A Civil Life in an Uncivil Time, Julia Wilbur's Struggle for Purpose. Thank you so much for making time to meet up with me here in person and chat with the History Author Show. Well, welcome to Alexandria. Well, when I'm in a historic building, I'm always overwhelmed by looking for the ghosts and the echoes of the past and wondering who was in this little part of the building, and what did they do, and is this wall original? So since this is your town, I'll let you start by giving us a little taste of the building we're in. What is its history, and how does it tie into this unique lady, Julia Wilbur, in your book? Okay. The building itself was constructed in the 1830s by sort of the city leaders, and the idea was to have a cultural mecca, a place for lectures in many 
growing cities around the country. They were, you know, people were doing this, trying to sort of, uh, you know, exchange ideas, that kind of thing. During the Civil War, this building, like many other buildings in Alexandria, was taken over by the Union Army. The Union came into Alexandria basically right when the Civil War began and was here until the end. So the Lyceum itself became a hospital, one of about 32 Union hospitals in the city. And Julia Wilbur, who came here in October of 1862, would have come here to visit patients, basically sort of providing comfort. She wasn't a nurse, but she would be coming to visit and, you know, sort of maybe provide snacks and help write letters and that sort of thing. One of the practical reasons that we're inside today is the street outside doesn't sound like the 1860s anymore, which is a benefit in some ways that we don't have shelling going on in the distance or soldiers marching through. There's cars and there's street noise and things like that. Set the stage for us. When Julie arrives here, she's a single woman, which is something that in this era, she's not just wandering around on her own. She doesn't have the opportunities, that which we'll get to here in uh, civil life in an uncivil time. It's a place where I'm picturing her walking down the street. Women would hold up the hem of their dresses, for instance, because horses, as beautiful as they are and as messy as we think cars are, they left certain things there in the street right. all the time. So talk about her as she's walking down the street and comes here for the first time. What is the area outside of this building look like? Well, she says in her diary, Alexandria is a dirty old town. And sure enough, many letters and newspaper accounts for the time pretty much echo the same thing. It was kind of a logistic center for the Union Army. So there was soldiers and people and houses and commerce kind of going all over the place. Right now we're on Washington Street, which was the major north-south thoroughfare at the time, and it still is. So even though the street is very different, it's also the kind of grid and geography of Alexandria today is very much similar to what she would have encountered We are about a half a mile from the Potomac River. Across the river, of course, is Washington, D.C., and there was constant kind of commerce back and forth between the two places. That was how Julia first came to to Alexandria, rather. First, she was in Washington. She took a train from her hometown of Rochester, New York, got to Washington, was originally thinking she would spend the war helping people in Washington. But when she got there, they said, oh, no, you really need to go to Alexandria. The need is much greater here. So she took a steamship over to Alexandria, and she spent from 1862 to 1865 here. I want to start with her where your journey begins, which right there you automatically, as a good author will, began right in the middle. She's already on the train, right, coming here, picturing her by herself in the era, in the time, big steam engine, you know, all the smoke, everything, the noise. And for her to begin that journey isn't something that is done, I guess you would say. <laughs> How did you first meet Julia Wilbur, so to speak? You obviously did. <laughs> You're not 100 years old. So you never met her physically. but Sometimes you- I feel like I yeah. have, but that's true. <laughs> well, and you told me something funny. You said you were introduced in an event, and they introduced you as Julia. And you said I was very professional. I didn't correct them or say anything or stop the presses. But I think that's a compliment, though, when somebody's writing out of a diary like this, that people begin to associate you so closely with her. But there was a time in your life where you knew nothing of Julia Wilbur. And I wanted to know, what is that aha moment where you meet her and begin to decide, I want to get to know her better and have those moments where you say, my gosh, her whole life is before my life. It's just fascinating. And then when did you decide to write about her in the book that became A Civil Life in an Uncivil Time? Well, I started with her diary. She did keep a diary for 50 years. And there's microfilm of it in our local library, in the local history room. So I kind of eased into her life, I guess you'd say, by offering to transcribe kind of the Civil War years for Alexandria Archaeology, which is one of our local history programs. And my intent originally was pretty much just to transcribe it, to try to you know, annotate some of the names and places that you know, would be unfamiliar to, to people and then get it online. And that is what I did for the first couple of years. But as I got more involved, I started wanting to, I wanted to read, you know, where was she before? I mean, how did she get here? What did she do afterwards? You know, just really start kind of filling out the picture when she refers to something, what were the newspapers saying at the time? You know, were there any archives records? So the Colonel was the Civil War years of her diary. And like many projects, it grew and grew and it became this book. I mentioned Julia getting on that train for the first time, and there's a line here in A Civil Life in an Uncivil Time. 
She writes, quote, my duty seemed to be in two places. And I wanted you to give readers a little taste. What did that mean for her? What were those two places where her heart and her head are torn between? Right. She was very much a product of her time in that she was a member of a large family. She was a third of 10 children. And she was a dutiful daughter. There were seven girls and three boys. Um, When her mother died, she took over doing a lot of the caretaking responsibilities for the younger siblings. As they got older and she kind of had more independence, she became a teacher. She was a teacher for about 10 years. She was becoming involved in abolitionists. So then, then she kind of took this sort of political turn for about 10 years. In the late 1850s, one of her sisters died and a toddler niece needed to be taken care of. So then she kind of pulled back to the personal. As you said, she her heart was in two places. She was struggling between two things. She moved back to her family's farm. She quit teaching. She sort of gave up her political leanings. Again, this was before the war in Rochester, or in the Rochester area, and became the caretaker for, um, for her niece. Through a series of events, the girl's father kind of reclaims his daughter, and uh, Julia is again sort of adrift, and the political side kind of, you know, kicks in again. And in 1862, after some kind of personal struggle of what should she do with her life, she was asked by a group called the Rochester Ladies Anti-Slavery Society, which was one of a number of women's groups across the North that raised money and tried to do work to first help people escape slavery, and then as they were escaping slavery, give them some support they asked if she would be willing to come down to Washington. And so, again, then the political side, the public side sort of you know, kicked in. When you say she was a teacher, I wanted to dwell on that for a minute because it's not like today where you go to school and then you get certified and maybe you're an assistant teacher or TA for a while. Right. She goes, takes the test, and it's such a human moment. She says, I don't know why they thought I had any business teaching. They ask her a couple of questions, and it was something where – It reflects on the greater theme of the book where here's a woman, oh, you want to be a teacher? Okay, that's acceptable. Sure, here, here's the class and go ahead and teach these kids, even though (laughs) there's really no reason to believe that's what she should be doing. Whereas when she goes and she says, I want to help the freedmen, I want to help escape slaves, I want to help after the war, these African-Americans who are now citizens – adapt to being free and and find some help in civil life, they say, well, you're a woman. Why, why would you think that? It's just so fascinating to juxtaposition that when she wants to be a teacher, all the doors open for her, even though that's not what she's called to do, and that's not what's in her heart, and that's not her dream. Her pursuit of happiness is to help other people, and everybody sort of cocks their heads, like when dogs used to listen to answering machines back when we had answering machines. And, well, wait a minute. What, why is my master's voice coming out of there? Right. So I thought that was fascinating, as the idea of her being a teacher, every door opens, but then she has to fight just to help people, where you would think, especially in this era, the Civil War does not end racial discrimination by any means, you would think somebody who wants to help would be just embraced, and yet she's really not. Well, it was a cause that don't have a lot of public support. And so, for example, when she came here, and one of the things she wanted to do was really try to advocate for better conditions, for better housing, for better health care, that sort of thing. It wasn't like the officialdom was just dying to help people who were escaping slavery. I mean, they were sort of giving them the minimum. So really, the resistance, I think even if she had been a true-hearted, really persistent male, even that would have been difficult because she was kind of advocating for things that people didn't necessarily want to like divert the resources to focus on. All along, she really had to, you know, when she saw something that she felt needed to be done, she needed to kind of fight to get it done. You're speaking here about her like a friend, which is something I also want to point out to people. If you ever wondered, wow, what it would be like to meet somebody who knew someone in the Civil War? That's really how you feel about her, especially sitting here in the Lyceum where you can look and see the walls, see those big pillars out front and feel like you're really stepping back in time. If you visit the museum, there's many pictures just on our way up here to this larger room where you really get taken back step by step into the past. A Civil Life in an Uncivil Time features what you describe, invoking Lincoln's words, a warts and all very human portrait. So she's writing this diary and I found myself reading it always a little bit embarrassed, right? When we read somebody's diary, even though they've been dead for 150 years, there's always a little bit of 
That and also cynicism, skepticism. Well, are they writing knowing someone's going to read it? Like if you read any of the Adams diaries, you know that they're writing for, for posterity. posterity right? right. So here's Julia. She has no reason to know that we're going to be sitting here in 2017 in the Lyceum. She would probably blow her mind and, you know, right. and, and having read her diaries. So who is she writing for as she's keeping a record of this unique life? Well, I do think she was aware that other people would be reading it because, you know, at a certain point she realizes that she's witnessing historic things. I can't say for sure because she never really says, you know, who the intended audience is. But, you know, it was something that was preserved through her family. It became into our public space because one of her great, great nephews was a professor at Haverford College. And when he, his name was Douglas Steer, he donated the diaries to Haverford, realizing that they really did have, you know, kind of a larger purpose. So there is a balance though, because yes, you know, I obviously really like her and I, I've gotten so enmeshed in her writing, but I'm also writing a book of history. And I have to be able to make sure that I kind of have the perspective of a historian in addition to, you know, kind of her, as you said, friend or, you know, really wanting the best for her, that kind of thing. And, you know, when there are things that are unflattering, I have to bring those up, too, you know. So um, that's that was kind of a bit of a challenge as I worked on the book, but um, hopefully I, I resolved it. That's some challenge, too. And it's something where I love to pull that back a little, peel back the actual craft of it, because you have those moments sometimes in history, many historians do, where they say, this subject surprised me, or they embarrassed me, or I wanted to cover that up for them. I interviewed Daniel Malik on his book, Agony and Eloquence, about John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. And he said when he uncovered Jefferson going and talking to the French about undermining Adams as vice president, he said, gosh, it just took him down so far. And I just was heartbroken at what he was doing and realizing that he was selling out the country that he was really committing treason. And I would, but I had to put it in the book. Right. And they are human. So that's part of the thing. We have to recognize that good or ill because we would write those things down about ourselves. So somebody has to write them to give us a full picture of it and remind us just who they were. And and I found you writing about her as another woman, someone you admire, somebody that you look at as having overcome all these obstacles. I started reading the book immediately. You, you get to know her. You showcase enough of it that you start to really pull for her. That when you see something in it that you realize, oh, that, that might turn a reader off. It's, it's interesting that you have to hone that voice to say, no, that's just you saying that because you're so close to it. How do you go about getting that distance? What were some of those things where you said, oh, I have to put this in. I have to think about it for a minute, how I'm going to do justice to right. that. Right. Well, I think the big thing was, you know, she kind of came here with this notion as many white abolitionists did of, oh, you know, we really know what's best. I mean, we were just going to help these poor people, that kind of thing. And, you know, not really seeing people as individuals. So as she heard people's stories and as she got to know people and as she worked with Harriet Jacobs, she, I think, went much further than I would say many, many, if not, you know, of the of people of her time in terms of you know, kind of going across the color line of working equally with people who are black and not thinking that, oh, I'm the white person, I know what's best. You know, but she didn't shed that sort of patronizing feeling entirely. If anything, it might have been a little bit more class-based maybe than race-based. But, you know, she was still, you know, kind of had some of that. And I had to sort of, I had to deal with that for sure. She had a few comments about religion that were, you know, a little irreligious I had to deal with. At times, she could be maybe a little bit of a stick in the mud. Um, you know, a couple of times she talks about going to various social events and they are not having the intellectual discourse that she wishes. And so she kind of maybe was over the corner sort of sulking or something. I'm not really sure. I can't say that she was doing that. But um, so there were times like that, too, where you just just lighten up a little bit, you know. So those are, so those are a couple of things that come to mind. And she has those African-American friendships. And I think it's an example we can always look at and say, when you met your first friend that was completely different than you, and today it's a much more diverse society and right. people are from all over because we have air travel in most places in the world, but you still go some places and people will never have seen someone who looks like you before. When I went to Ireland in as recent as 1989, the first time I went, and it still happens a little bit today if I go real deep into the Gaelic speaking areas of Ireland, I, I'll have always little Irish girls just stare at me. And it's because I'm dark and I'm you know, right. skinned and then dark hair. And you know, I mean, I, I just look different. A Greek person looks very different than these little, the fact that they don't look away. Most of the time, if I look at you, 
And I'm saying, oh, look, that, that woman over there, she looks like an author I know. And then you look at me, I'll look away. And over there, they just keep staring at you. It's right. so, They're almost like ghost children. I'm afraid to go and like put my <laughs> hand through them. You know, I talked about seeing ghosts here at the Lyceum. That's, that's that kind of thing there in Ireland. They told some of the people that were African-American with the Rutgers University Band. We went there to play halftime at the Emerald Isle Classic football game in 1989. And they said there's people in Ireland, a lot of them have maybe never seen somebody before who is of African ancestry. And just be prepared. They may ask you some really insensitive questions. Right. Like my wife's brother, Brian, is a really tall, redheaded, pale Irish guy. And when he was doing missionary work and visiting all these places in Asia, so people would just want to take a picture with him. Right. The kids would follow him everywhere and just want to stand there because he looked so different. And the fact that she is willing to call people friend, well, even though we all have our flaws, that comes across here that that's important for her to seek these people out, not right. leave by the not leave at the end of the day as if she's dealing with them with the perspective that people have in a dog pound, which is what a lot of these people do. Well, I've done enough for you. We fought the Civil War. You're free now. Here, go. Well, that's not how it works. So she's trying to fill that void in this time where people are saying, we have enough of our own problems. We've fought the war to free you. Now you're on your own. She wants to go beyond that even to say she's going to be friends with people. And I thought that that spoke well of her. That was her high ideal. And yet, Maybe because you give us that full perspective of her life, we appreciate it even more because we know she struggles with all the same flaws that we all have. Right, exactly. Yeah. When we say Civil War diary and I tell people a civil life in an uncivil time adds another one on top of the diaries we have of the period. It's unique. As I read it, I said, well, this is not just another one. This is a single woman, which I mentioned, and that's something that maybe some listeners can't relate to just how unique that is that she takes off on her own. She's there on a train by herself, and she's traveling all this way on her own, getting a job completely out of the acceptable sphere. She's beyond what they called at the time prime marrying age for the era, so she's an anomaly yet again there. She's kind of expected to have just a very few limited roles. And you mentioned teaching, but what are some of the other roles that would have been available? What is the sphere so we can give listeners and your readers an idea of the mold she's really breaking? Well, probably just being basically the family caregiver, you know, whenever somebody needs because of an illness or some other need, I mean, that it would be expected that she would be the person who would step in, would spend six months here and a year here and two weeks here helping various family members, which, you know, she did to a certain extent early in her life, but she finally decides to break away. And so that would be probably the other kind of expected role besides teacher that a kind of middle class woman would be able to assume. As you know, kind of nursing was sort of becoming something during the Civil War that some women did. You know, Louisa May Alcott, I mean, was most famous, and Clara Barton. But um, that was not something that would even, even that was pretty extraordinary for the time. I interviewed an author, Doug Stanton, who wrote Horse Soldiers, and we talked about his upcoming book, The Odyssey of Echo Company, about the Vietnam War. And he said, I'm never afraid to ask the obvious question. So I'm going to do that and be the five-year-old here who doesn't know what's appropriate and ask the question that people maybe wonder. We can see, Julia, on the front of your book cover, why is she unmarried? Why does that never come? Why does she never find the right man? Um, Well, one thing that happened was when she was 19, her mother died. And she spent really the next about 10 years taking care of younger family members. So, I mean, that really was kind of prime marriageable age. That might be one reason. You know, there were other single women, um, you know, of her era. Also, at a certain point, she's really not unhappy about that. I mean, she talks about kind of her single blessedness. She realizes that she, in certain ways, has even more freedom than married women at the time. Don't forget, you know, married women really even had a more circumscribed role, you know, kind of within the family structure. She recognizes that when she's about 30 years old, she writes some things in her diary that kind of recognize that, you know, she does have a certain freedom of movement that her married friends do not. Her life is of her choosing much more. And that's what I wanted to get at with that question. You did it really well in that answer, because even with that question, you're trying to fit her into a mold saying, well, basically what's wrong with you? As I said, people will look at the cover and say, well, she's not deformed. She looks fine. It's a good time of year. She has a a good family, a good father. Well, maybe the bottom line answer is because she didn't want to. It wasn't the, it wasn't her path and her life. I mean, she talks about yearning for love and connections throughout her life not necessarily romantic connections, but definitely 
very deeply felt personal connections. And that was, you know, that was really maybe another one of the, when I talk about, you know, her struggle for purpose, you know, there was a struggle kind of on a political level, but there was also a struggle on a personal level to find meaning with her family and friends. I wanted you to take us back to the Civil War era. We talked here about the Lyceum and how this building was standing at the time and played a role in Julia Wilbur's life. But if you walk around Alexandria, which I know you do, we talked about a little bit before we began recording, what else can people see here of Julia's Alexandria as it existed at the time she was doing all this work? Well, you know, a fair amount, actually. First of all, you know, a lot of the sidewalks are kind of brick and kind of uneven. And, you know, you can kind of at least sort of conjure up kind of a time when she might have been walking. About a block or so south of here, there is a building, um, which is actually on the cover of the book uh, and, you know, kind of uh, screened out and also inside the book. This is still standing. It was, they used it back at the time. It was a confiscated home of a private family. They used it for a clothing room. They would solicit clothing from people up north, and she and Harriet Jacobs set up a room to distribute clothing to people who needed it. Um, She lived there for a time. There was a hospital on one side of it. So um, that building is still standing. A couple of cemeteries are still there. A couple of churches that were hospitals are still here. Those that no longer have their original purpose, there's a lot of historical markers around town. The barracks for freedmen were built, and there is a mark there, even though it was disassembled shortly after the war. Huge hospital for African-American soldiers. A piece of it is still there. It has a very, I guess, unique history itself. It began as a slave trading place in the 1820s. And through some fortune, and in, in that we can have it to remember today, it is now the office of the Northern Virginia Urban League, and there's a small museum in it as well. So that is also still standing. So there is a lot for a visitor to come see. I have another quote here out of A Civil Life in an Uncivil Time. You write, quote, Despite the setbacks, hope for a better time marked the life of Julia Wilbur. That's an epitaph any of us would be proud to have chiseled into our headstone. So I'd like to you to give us one of your favorite stories about her. What was it about her writing as a diarist that made you say, hmm, I'm going to sit up a little straighter here. Wow, what a hopeful lady. Despite all this death and destruction, there would have been men marching down here past the Lyceum with limbs missing, blinded, all this horror and war. She sees Lincoln twice, and then Lincoln's assassination occurs. So how did she maintain that hopefulness? What's one of those stories that made you say, I can give this as her epitaph? Right. Well, I guess one thing that comes to mind is really after the war, she tries to register to vote. You know, women's suffrage is 60 years down the road, I mean, we know that in retrospect, but in 1869, D.C. had municipal elections. Congress had allowed, this is even before the amendments, you know, for male suffrage, for black male suffrage uh, nationwide. There were municipal elections and black men were allowed to vote in 1867. And she's kind of watches that and the thought processes among her and other women are starting to move. And so sure enough, in 1869, you know, she marches down to headquarters of the, you know, the election headquarters and tries to register to vote. At the time, she was actually trying to apply for a job at the patent office. And people were saying to her, like, don't be so visible. I mean, you're trying to get a job. And yet the spirit moved her and she went nonetheless. You're enjoying my chat with Paula Tarnapol Whitaker about her book, A Civil Life in an Uncivil Time, Julia Wilbur's Struggle for Purpose. We are in the Lyceum, Alexandria's Historic Museum in Virginia. It's a great place to walk past. One of those buildings where you walk past and you say, I wonder what goes on inside there. And this is one where you could just walk in the door because it is a functioning museum. You can find Paula at paulawhitaker.com or at P.T. Whitaker on Twitter. And you can toss her a like at facebook.com slash P.T. Whitaker. Lisa Wolfinger, co-creator and executive producer of the PBS miniseries Mercy Street, says of A Civil Life in an Uncivil Time, quote, I urge everyone to pick up a copy and delve deeper into a chapter of Civil War history that has been overlooked for far too long, unquote. 
Paula, the word that jumps out at me there is overlooked. There are just so many books published on this topic. There are so many diarists. There are all those big set pieces and figures, the Grants, the Lincolns, Shermans, Lee, all of these Civil War veterans who had nothing but time in their hands to sit around and write and rewrite the history of the war after it occurs. So it's tough to find a unique perspective, yet here you are. So coming out of that review, make your pitch to listeners who maybe think they've read it all on the war, who see the cover of your book and say, a civil life in an uncivil time. Well, how will that improve my understanding of the conflict? Tell us how it will. Well, as you said, there was Grant, there was Sherman, there was Lee. I mean, there were the great figures, and they obviously are really important to read. But, you know, the war was made up of quote unquote little figures too, of real people doing real things. And one of the things that I tried to do in this book was just show how an individual person, you know, a woman without wealth, without influence, without power, was able to think of the ways that she could make a difference during this time of upheaval. So I'm trying to, I guess, maybe show the war from a slightly different perspective, obviously from a woman's point of view, but also from, you know, the the point of view of someone who was right in the midst of things, but not on the battlefield or in a hospital, which, you know, we've seen a lot of that as well. She's a woman whose view is something that you wouldn't even think could possibly exist. She's such a unique character that I think if you picked it up, I know if I did and it was a novel, I would say, well, that seems really far afield. Did you base it on an actual person? And here she is, real. One of the reasons why is she's a Quaker. And she reminded me of another Quaker woman who worked for equality, Alice Paul. We chatted about her with Deborah Copps. And you mentioned right there about her pushing for the right to vote for women well before it, it becomes achievable in, or well before it is achieved in 1920. How did that background, that Quaker background, specifically the roles of men and women, inspire Julia to join the abolitionist movement? We talked about her going, but we began in the middle. How does she decide that she's going to go work and to end this peculiar institution, as they called it in the South? Well, I think obviously her Quakerism although she did not sort of remain that active um, in terms of, you know, going to worship and, and that sort of thing. But, you know, it was kind of part of her DNA, basically. She grew up near Poughkeepsie, New York, in an area where there were a lot of Quakers. She went briefly to Nine Partners Boarding School, which is where Lucretia Mott went, and Daniel Anthony, the father of Susan B. Anthony. So, um, you know, she was definitely sort of exposed to all these all these thoughts and ideas. When she got to Rochester, it's interesting, in 1845, right, so the cusp of Frederick Douglass really becoming famous. He had published his book, but it had not become sort of the bestseller that it became. There was a little notice in the paper that he was going to be giving a talk that day, and she goes to it, and she writes in her diary something like, she has to describe, you know, kind of give a context, the fugitive slave. She has to sort of explain who it is in her diary. And then from there, you know, first she's kind of in the audience of going to these public lectures, of which Rochester had many. And pretty soon she's becoming involved in two societies that were in Rochester. One was called the Western New York Anti-Slavery Society. The other was called the Rochester Ladies Anti-Slavery Society. So she starts moving into a more active role. And her family is not universally behind her when they, she decides she's going to get on that train. That, no, definitely not. In fact, I would say that they were, uh, <laughs> you know, her father just thought it was just a really outrageous idea. She had tried at one other point, and um, she didn't, you know, one one way, another, you know, reason that she was able to come was that the this Rochester group did pay her expenses, so she didn't have to ask, like, her family for money. There was another time where I believe she would have had to ask her father for money, and he said no, and so she was not able to go, and that was to go to Port Royal. So one of the things that I think is sort of significant, too, is that if she had gone, say, to Port Royal or, you know, some of the other kind of more structured places she would have sort of fit into what other people were defining that relief agents or missionaries, however you want to call them, would do. Because she came here, she came on her own, no job description. She had to figure out where she was going to live, no organized sort of association that she had here. She was kind of having to figure it out on her own. I have one final question. Otherwise, we're going to get locked here, I think, in the license. They've been very generous we, with their time. We but... would really be with the ghost in that <laughs> yeah, case. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, <laughs> overnight and wait, wait for something to inspire us to think of Julia, what it would have been like for her to wander around these halls in the 1860s. In your prologue, you talk about contemplating what you'd do if you were faced with Julia Wilbur's choices. 
say you're a young reader in Julia's shoes today. You're a person that's torn between duty to family and ambition to make a positive difference, something that's burning inside you. Those are key moments in a person's life. And Julia Wilbur here in A Civil Life in an Uncivil Time is an example, I think, male or female. You're, she's somebody who you would have liked to have read this book. I would have liked to have read her book when I was that age. So what do you hope those readers, all readers, will gain from reading A Civil Life in an Uncivil Time? Well, I think young and old, she made choices. So what could she as an individual to do? How could she lead a civil life in an uncivil time? I mean, even today, I feel like that resonates because we're also living in very chaotic times. I think she would challenge us to say, how could we make a difference? In terms of the question about her family versus you know, the kind of political sphere, particularly earlier on, she did go back and forth. She always had a strong sense of family. She did go back to New York several times when there was a sickness or a death in the family. So it's not like she cut all ties with folks back home. And so you can do it all. <laughs> you just have to make decisions <laughs> and you just have to sort of do the best you can. And not have regret. I mean, everyone's going to have enough of it in their life, but try to do it the best you can. And right. she continues this diary through the end of her life almost, does she? 18, right, just, just uh, a couple. Yeah, I mean, really just a couple months before she dies. And are all those still in existence? They aren't. So um, she actually kept two sets of diaries and these little pocket diaries we have until her death. There was sort of another set of diaries that end sort of abruptly in the 1870s. I'm sort of assuming that there were subsequent years that were lost, but at least we do have these pocket diaries through the end of her life. I know I said that was going to be my last question, but I'll jam another one in. And that's, if there was one thing in her diary that you wish she would have told you, what would it be? Oh, um, see, I'm springing this on. I know. Uh, That is, um, I guess, as you asked before, what did she expect to have happen to these diaries? What, What would she have liked to have seen us do with what she wrote and what she experienced? Well, Paula Tarnapol Whitaker, author of A Civil Life in an Uncivil Time, thank you so much for joining me and for reintroducing us to a forgotten voice from the past. I feel like you called me and said, hey, let's meet at a friend's house, even though she didn't live here per se. It's a fun place and it's great to be able to walk in the footsteps of such an ambitious and unique figure in history. I hope listeners will pick up the book and hear what Julia Wilbur has to say to them today from those ghostly days of 1860. If you ever wanted to hear a ghost speak to you, I can't think of a better one to listen to than Julia Wilbur. Thank you so much. Again, the book is A Civil Life in an Uncivil Time. Julia Wilbur's Struggle for Purpose. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at historyauthor.com. And we hope you will click through there, or even navigate using the Amazon banner on our homepage the next time you purchase anything from Amazon. You go to historyauthor.com, our banner takes you through to Amazon, and amazon.com gives us a small portion of every dollar you spend at no additional charge in your shopping cart. For just those few extra taps of your finger, you can help us keep the flux capacitor on our time machine humming like usual. And that means we'll be able to keep bringing you great authors and great trips into the past. My sincere thanks to Paula Tarnapol Whitaker, not only for joining me, but for meeting me at the Lyceum and showing me a little bit around the historic town of Alexandria, Virginia. She brought to life Julia Wilbur's diaries of the Civil War period in a way that even reading the book alone can only come close to. It's so great to walk in the actual footsteps of people in history. Visit the Lyceum, or you can visit our guest at paulawhitaker.com. You can also find her at P.T. Whitaker on both Twitter and Facebook. And while you're at it, let us know what you think of the book and the interview on Twitter at History Dean or Facebook.com slash History Author. That's it for this installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us back in the Manhattan studio 
for our next all-new interview right here on iHeartRadio. And if you're an iTunes subscriber, you know what to do. Take a minute to leave us a review. Those stars really help. Well, until our next trip into the past together, thanks so much for time traveling with us today, and have a great week. Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore.